whatever it is that you want until you can be really happy without it, you probably won't get it. God has big plans for you. I want you all to know that. Oh my gosh, if, we, if God would open the spirit realm and we could see all that God has planned for us, no matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, God has got great things in store for you. God is never going to let us just stop. He's always got something greater for us. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that we could ever dare to hope, ask, or think according to His power that works in us. And I just want you to know tonight, I'm talking to you, 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 and you watching my TV. See, you thought I didn't know you were there, but I do know you're there. And I'm very glad you're watching today. And I just think you're awesome, absolutely awesome. And God loves you, and He's got a good plan for your life. Maybe the devil's come along and he's tried to mess up God's plan. You think, well, it's too late for me, you know, my life's all messed up. There's an interesting thing about God, even if you messed up plan A, God can make plan B better than plan A ever would have been just because He's God. So it's not too late and you've not done too much wrong. God has got good things in store for you. But there are things you're going to have to learn. And tests are good for us simply because they show us the weak areas in us. They show us the weak areas in us. Well, see, we're usually like, well, you know, if I just wouldn't get tempted all the time. <laughs> well, you know what? Now listen, because this is what the Scripture says in James. We really can't be tempted if there's nothing in us in that area for the devil to play on. I can tell you that I have no concern at all that I will be tempted to go rob the local bank when this meeting's over. <laughs> that is not any kind of a temptation that I could ever even remotely have. But I don't know, it's possible that there's somebody in here tonight that's fighting the temptation to go rob 7-Eleven when we dismiss. <laughs> You're like, now Joyce, that's ridiculous. No, it's not. Because there are people from all kinds of backgrounds and all, have had all kinds of things happen and, and people with all kinds of needs. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you came in here tonight and, and you're being tempted to kill yourself. You're being tempted to commit suicide. And maybe you came here as a last ditch effort just to see what God will say. Well, he's saying, don't you dare do anything like that because I've got great things in mind for you. Great things in mind for you. And I believe even right now there's somebody watching by television and that's exactly what's been on your mind because God just put it on my mind. It wasn't part of my message. And God is speaking to you. You have got a great life in front of you and don't you dare give up. Do you know that wanting to give up is a temptation? You know that? Wanting to quit is a temptation. If your finances aren't going right and you're tempted to quit giving, that's a temptation. There's some things you've got to make your mind up about. And you know what? I've already decided. This is what I believe. This is where I stand. This is what I'm doing. I'm not turning back. I'm going to keep my commitments. I'm going to be faithful. And I'm not going to go around getting upset every time I don't get my way. That was a huge problem in my life for a lot of years. I was cool as long as everything was going my way, but honey, when it wasn't, I was like another person, a Christian Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? So these tests are good for us, and even if you have to say it totally by faith, the next time you're tested, just say, this is good for me. I don't know, it sure don't feel good, but it's good for me. How many of you have gotten closer to God in your hard times than you ever have in good times? And how many of you have learned so much in your hard times? How many of you look back now and you thank God for some of the things that you went through that you despised while you were going through them? 
You know why? Because they made you the man or the woman of God that you are now. Now, you know what? There still may be some things in there that God needs to deal with and God needs to get out and God needs to set you free from because if he leaves us with those things in us, then there are things that Satan can play on. And God wants us to get to the point where Jesus was when he said, Satan hath no part in me. And that's the exact place that we need to get to where we can say, devil, you can throw your best shot, but I've already made my mind up what I'm doing and I am not going to worry with you nor bother you, nor even entertain your stupid thoughts. But you see, you never get a testimony without a test. And the sad thing is, is a lot of people after the test, all they have is the monies. They never have the testimony. <laughs> they just moan the whole rest of their life about their lot in life and what's happened to them and how it's not fair. And, I could still be moaning because I was sexually abused by my dad. I could still be moaning over that. And I know people that are. They're still moaning over something that happened 25 years ago and 30 years ago. Well, my husband did this. Well, you know what? It's time to get over it and go on and live the rest of your life and let God show himself strong in you. Now, I'm not saying that we don't hurt, but if you're still moaning over something that happened 10 years ago, then, I mean, it's time to go on. Otherwise, you're going to miss your whole life. End up with a testimony, not just the monies. The thing about trials is, is they're so much harder on you if you're just fighting them and fighting them and resisting them and fighting them. Sometimes you just got to say, okay, God, whatever the purpose is in this, I just, just, I'm in your hands. And although it may sound a little bit of a strange way to put it, sometimes you just have to embrace things that are painful and just say, let this do the work that it needs to do. Let it draw me closer to you. Let it give me greater character. But I was going through all these different things and fighting them and fighting them and resisting them and I mean, I thought I was fighting the devil. I was rebuking the devil, rebuke, rebuke, rebuke. And I rebuked until I didn't have a rebuke left in me and I still had the problems. And finally, I asked God to show me what was going on. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Starting in verse 2. And you shall earnestly remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Imagine that. God will lead you even in the wilderness. To humble you and to prove you, to humble you and to prove you, to know what was in your mind and heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. See, if we're not going to keep God's commandments in the wilderness, in the desert, then we're not going to keep God's commandments on the mountaintop. Amen? How many of you know it's easy to kind of act right when everything's going your way? But it's a totally different thing to do what's right when not much of anything is going your way. And he goes on here and he says, verse 3, I humbled you and I allowed you to hunger and I fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you recognize and personally know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, God was messing with their circumstances. Is he, is, is he messing with any of your circumstances? See? It's like, man, things just aren't going good right now. I wanted this and I don't have it. I had this and... I lost it. It got taken away from me. He was trying to teach them that their joy wasn't in their circumstances, but their joy was in knowing his word and, and being rooted and grounded in the word and being rooted and grounded in him. And here's the bottom line. Whatever it is that you want, now listen to me because this is good. Whatever it is that you want until you can be really happy without it, you probably won't get it. Come on. That was worth you coming right there. Whatever it is that you want, I think I better preach this to this side. <laughs> Whatever it is that you want, well, if my husband doesn't change and stop doing this, then there's just no way I can be happy. Yeah, you can. Because I used to think that 
and he still hasn't stopped doing a lot of it, and I'm happy. <laughs> Amen? I used to think if Dave is going to spend his whole life loving everything that bounces and rolls, because <laughs> I don't really like any kind of sports, and he loves every one of them, and it was just a real issue for me. Your joy is not in stuff. It's not in circumstances. It's in Christ. And I think anybody can be happy anywhere if they make a decision to be happy. You're not all sure about that. I said, I think anybody can be happy anywhere if you make a decision to be happy. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy, but it is doable. The last thing that you want to give up during trials is your joy. Because the minute you give up your joy, you lose your strength. And I might say that you don't lose your joy until you lose your peace. So when you lose your peace, your joy is going to be the next thing that's going to go. The Bible talks about fiery trials that God allows us to go through to test our quality, to test our character and our quality. What about worry? You know, worry is not trust, is it? Exodus 16, God gave them manna every day. What a wonderful miracle. But he told them they could only gather enough for one day. Well, what about tomorrow? What if this miracle doesn't show up again tomorrow? If they gathered more than enough for one day, then what they gathered began to stink and it rotted. And sometimes we say, my life stinks. Well, a lot of it's because we're trying to get tomorrow's manna today. There's probably a lot of things right now that you don't know and don't have understanding about, but God's got a plan. Amen? God's got a plan. You say, well, I've got a plan too. I heard about a billboard that said, make me laugh. Tell me your plans. And it was signed God. That's good, isn't it? Make me laugh. Tell me your plans. God. You know why? Because man's mind plans his way, but God directs his steps. How can a man understand his way when it's God that directs his steps? Here in Deuteronomy, he talks about all the things that he led them through, and it's so precious when you get over here just a little bit to verses seven through nine, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, and fountains, and springs flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates. And he goes on and on and on about every good thing that God has in mind for them. So he said, I'm leading you through these hard places because I have a plan to bless you. But there's some stuff that I, we got to deal with first. There's some stuff you've got to learn. And some things you can learn from somebody telling you, but a lot of things you can only learn from experience. I was reading again last week in Proverbs where it says, wisdom which is learned by costly experience. And I love that. I've got some wisdom now, but I've learned it by costly experience. Costly, things that hurt me things that were hard, things that cost me, but now I've got something that nobody can take away from me. And now I've actually got something that I can say to somebody else. It's not just fluff and hot air. And you can, you can feel that it's right because there's even an anointing on it. And it's like, even if your head doesn't want to accept it, your heart's saying, this is right. I know this is right. God wants to bless you. But you can't stay bitter and resentful and be blessed. And I can tell you there's probably more people in this building tonight that are mad at somebody than those who aren't. Well, you don't understand. It's just too. Everybody look at me. Let me tell you something. You're never going to be free from anything until you stop making excuses. I love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. <laughs> Let's say that one more time, maybe to this side of the room. You're never going to be free from anything until you stop making excuses. 
But see, you're, you're going to miss what God has for you if you won't do what God is asking you to do. Well, it's just too hard. Excuse. <laughs> it's just not fair. Excuse. <laughs> well, I've been mistreated in my life. Excuse. I should have brought my excuse bag this weekend. We've all got one, you know. We carry one with us. We've got all kinds of excuses. God lets us go through things because he wants to bless us. God wants to bless you. Say, don't panic. This is only a test. You didn't say it very happily. All right. Now, part of this trust test, which is what we're teaching on tonight, trust in God when you have trials and things you don't understand. Trust in God when you don't see the way. There's just like, there's no way. There just is absolutely no way. Do you know God is not always conventional? He doesn't always do things the way we'd expect him to or what we would think he would do. You know, the Israelites had a nifty little thing happen while they were out there. For 40 years, their shoes didn't wear out. Now, you know, God had water come out of a rock. He rained manna down from heaven. So I was just thinking tonight, why couldn't he about at least once a year during those 40 years, why couldn't they have just ran into this huge mountain of shoes? <laughs> There's about a million and a half of them out there. And if they all had two feet, which I guess they did, that's three million shoes. That would have been a pretty big pile. But if he can part the Red Sea, he could give some shoes miraculously, but he didn't do it that way. He didn't do it the way that it would have seemed to have made sense. What did he do? He anointed their shoes so they wouldn't wear out for 40 years. Some of you don't know why we're excited about that. Well, I wouldn't want to wear the same pair of shoes for 40 years either. But the point is, is God met their need even though he didn't meet it in what would have been the conventional way to meet the need. Let me tell you something. You may think the door is closed and God's making a new door at the back of the house. God doesn't make a way. He is the way. Well, God, there's just no way. He doesn't want to hear that. He wants to hear, God, you are the way. And it doesn't matter if I see one or not, you are the way. How about trusting God when you just don't understand? I mean, it just makes no sense at all. I'll tell you something that I've come to after many, many, many years of walking with God. And starting out in the beginning, why, God, why, 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 God, why, why, why? I can tell you that I really just don't waste my time with that question anymore. Because first of all, you usually don't get an answer. <laughs> and how many of you understand what I mean when I say that trust doesn't always require an answer? <laughs> Some of you could leave this meeting tonight with unbelievable peace if you would just make a decision right here, right now, I am finished trying to figure this out. <laughs> you guys must need a brain boost. You're a little slow tonight. <laughs> Isn't that right? I am just not going to try to figure this out anymore. When God when, why God why, how God how, who God who. Who am I going to marry? Oh God, please show me who, who am I going to marry? Who am I going to marry? Who am I going to marry? Probably not whoever you think it is. <laughs> you don't have to understand everything. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. I think this is the coolest scripture. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. For we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about the affliction and the oppressing distress 
which befell us in the province of Asia, how we were so utterly and unbearably weighed down and crushed that we even despaired of life itself. So Paul must have been having some pretty serious problems. Now watch this. Indeed, we felt within ourselves that we had received the very sentence of death. But that was to keep us from trusting in and depending on ourselves instead of God who raises the dead. So the whole purpose for that was just to put them in a situation where they had no choice but to trust God. <laughs> Have you ever been like that? No choice at all but to trust God. I had a time like that in my life. Had many times like that in my life, but you know, I had cancer one time. When you got cancer, you, you have no choice but to trust God. I mean, that's it. That's one you got to trust God with. And that was 22 years ago, and we can all see I'm still here, and everything's fine. <laughs> On February the 18th, my back started hurting of this year. And with the exception of maybe one or two days, it hurt pretty much continuously until about the end of April. I had to, ha I had to have this chair at one point, now I've kind of decided I like it, so <laughs> I'm going to keep it. Sometimes I get feisty and twirl around in it, it's kind of fun. <laughs> so I learned a piece of wisdom through that back problem I had. And the wisdom is, is I can sit down. And I can still preach just as good as if I'm running all over the place. And you know what? I'm not nearly as tired when it's over. But now, I mean, I was literally trusting God for every step. I mean, I can honestly tell you that that was the worst pain I've ever had except when I had babies. I mean, it was bad, really bad. I had three epidural cortisone injections in my back. I had a bone scan. I had an MRI. I saw a surgeon. They're like, no, you don't need surgery. You've got a disc that's a little messed up, but that's not what's causing your problem. You know, then one doctor wanted me to go do water aquatic exercises. I'm like, no, I've been working out three and a half years. I'm not going backwards to that. Thank you. And then he said, well, you know, when you're out on the road, <laughs> when you're out on the road, this is what he suggested, darling. In between your sessions, you should go to the pool and exercise. I'm like, you don't get it. I mean, I was just like, but you know what I decided? And here's sometimes what you got to decide during those times. You know what I told people? I said, you know what? My gift is in my mouth, not in my back. And if they have to wheel me out here on a bed, I can still preach. And I would probably just be the type that would do it too. Because I've already paid too dear of a price to give up now. Amen? You say, well, so what was that all about, that whole back thing? I don't know. I don't know. It's probably just the devil, but I sure learned a lot of good things out of it. I learned some better things about how to take care of myself. Got a whole bunch of new shoes because I had to get rid of a lot of my ones that were too high and not comfortable. And so that was fun. <laughs> Eat the cookie, buy the shoes, like that. <laughs> but I was literally trusting God one step at a time. I mean, I honestly... I had a conference coming up. I had a book signing tour, which are the hardest things that I do except going out of the country. And then I had another conference, and that was all three weeks right now. Bang, 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 bang. I'm thinking, I mean, I was like, God, <laughs> if you don't do something. Well, you know what? Sure enough, the first conference, I did have to sit a lot, but I was okay. I got through it. The book signing, I didn't have hardly any pain at all. It's like God shows up right in time. You don't have to wonder what's going to happen, when this and when that, and if you don't see the way. Because God is the way. He will make a way for you where there seems to be no way. How many of you believe that?
Well, James 1.12 says, Blessed, happy, and to be envied is the man who is patient under trial and stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. As we're talking about today, many things in life, it's just a test that we need to pass. We need to be much more concerned about our behavior, our reaction to what's happening, than we are what's actually happening. Je kindertijd. Een tijd om te dansen in de zon en te zingen in de regen. Een tijd om uitbundig te lachen en onbekommerd op avontuur te gaan. En om je vervelende broertje te plagen. Kind zijn betekent leren, groeien, geloven en dromen. Maar ook nu zijn er op de wereld heel veel kinderen die geen idee hebben van hoe je kindertijd zou moeten zijn. Ze zijn alleen bezig met overleven. Deze kleintjes moeten s'nachts vaak slapen zonder een dak boven hun hoofd. Ze hebben dorst, lijden honger en voelen zich eenzaam. Sommige van hen hebben zichzelf die dag meer malen moeten verkopen... voordat ze hun misbruikte lichaam te rusten kunnen leggen. Helaas is dit niet een verhaaltje over een handvol kinderen in een onzichtbare wereld. Nee, het is een keiharde werkelijkheid. Hier en nu, voor echte kinderen, onze kinderen... Sommigen leven bij jou om de hoek. Anderen hier vele duizenden kilometers vandaan. Maakt die afstand dat een kind minder behoefte heeft aan liefde, bescherming en verzorging? Maken geslacht, ras of omstandigheden dat een kind minder deel uitmaakt van onze menselijke familie? Nee, toch? Een mens is een mens. Een nood is een nood. En een kind is een kind. Zo kostbaar in Gods ogen. In welke uithoek van de wereld een kind ook om hulp roept... wij moeten er gehoor aan geven. Op welke grond de tranen van een kind ook vallen... wij gaan erheen. We have traveled long.
die mensen wereldwijd die ons hun steun waard vinden, zijn wij in staat om vele hulpbehoevende kinderhanden vast te pakken. Maar er zijn nog veel meer kinderen op de wereld die schreeuwen om hulp. Geeft u daar gehoor aan? Ze zijn op zoek naar een helpende hand. Helpt u ons mee om ze die te bieden? Word je wel eens bevangen door negatieve gedachten? Kun je ze niet meer van je afschudden? Laat je gedachtenwereld geen geestelijke schroothoop worden. Joyce Meyer heeft hierover een boek geschreven. Kracht in je denken. Want onze gedachten bepalen wie wij zullen zijn. Bestel het boek Kracht in je denken. 12 power thoughts voor de strijd in je denken nu. Via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel... 026 20 22 100. Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en ontvang elke dag inspirerende uitspraken van Joyce op jouw Facebook. Open, direct en to the point. Kleine oases in je dagelijks leven. Lees mee, het is het waard. Alleen bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.